All right, we've got uh, some handouts for the lesson this morning. We're uh, continuing our study through the Psalms. <clears throat> so this is Lesson 5, Finding Israel's Historical Roots in the Psalms. Uh, just as a uh, way of reminder, I'll be out the next couple of weeks, but the Jesse will be um, teaching the class. Make sure you pay attention to your class schedule. Again, next Sunday, uh, you're going to be doing two lessons. Uh, make sure you pay attention to that. Also, I uh, hope that you're keeping up with your, your psalms reading as, uh, again, the way that the book is designed, we're not necessarily going through on a psalm-by-psalm -psalm basis. Uh, to This morning, we will read through several of the psalms that have to deal specifically with um, the historical roots uh, that uh, Randy is talking about here in the lesson. And just to start off, the very first paragraph of the lesson, it says, The book of Psalms is not even remotely a historical book in the sense of being a record of history. It is poetry. Yet the history of humanity, and particularly of Israel, is interwoven in various ways throughout the Psalms. As one commentator has put it, history is the soil in which literature grows. So you've probably heard uh, growing up, uh, at least I know I did, I have one specific history teacher that I feel like he said this every time that we would walk into class, that those that don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Uh, he would just constantly say that. And so there's obviously lessons that we can learn uh, from the, the history of the children of Israel, even within the Psalms. And we've talked some about the, the different types of Psalms, the Psalms of praise, the Psalms of, of wisdom, uh, and, and several others. And so there are a few that scholars have called historical Psalms. Uh, Psalm 78, 105 through 107, 114, 135, and 136. These have uh, more of a historical tone to them. There are snippets of history in some of the other psalms. There are psalms of praise that refer back to events that happened uh, in the past and reasons why people should be uh, praising God and giving God adoration. Uh, but just a, a general question to everybody. Why do some of the psalms pick up on ancient history and incorporate them into the hymns? What would the benefit of that be? Past the history. Um, it's, so a way, what? it's a way to pass that history. Past, okay. Yeah. It's, it's kind of, you know, oral history and, and songs are a good way to remember, you know, the historical events that have happened. Was it, was it important to God that they remember their history? Can you think of, of things that he actually set in place to make sure that they didn't forget? Yes, yeah, sir. For them to teach their children so they would teach their children. All right. So they were specifically to, to teach their children. Were the things set up, though, to help them not forget? Norm? They had uh, festivals. They had, uh, uh, well, Sabbath, every, every Sabbath, so every six days, they were, you know, so they had, they had regular things on a regular basis. Yeah, and one of the things that I thought about was the, the altars that they would set up, uh, specifically whenever they uh, would, would conquer the land or they crossed over the river, and, and so they're to build this altar. What was the purpose of it? And so the Lord is saying, so even when your kids walk by and they say, well, what is this? So you can tell them that you can share this information with them because it's important. Uh, and so I think that, uh, yes, it, it's to pass this, this history on so that they remember the history so that hopefully that they... Uh, don't repeat it themselves. Why else, maybe? It's something they all share and all related to. Okay. Yeah, I mean, this, this, is, this is who they are. Uh, you know, if you um, are, are big into history, I know Clarissa loves history, but it's something that is important to us, our history, family history. Uh, it's something that is unique to us. Uh, and one of the things that I think is, is key about this is this is finding Israel's historical roots, but one of the questions actually kind of deals with this a little bit. It's our historical roots as well, and so it's something that should be important to us. So besides just passing on of the information, what's the benefit of even having these in the, the Psalms? When I was studying this, it reminded me of the song of Moses in Deuteronomy, and right before they're going into the land of Canaan, God specifically tells Moses, I want you to sing a song to the children of Israel. And before the song and after the song, he tells him why. And in 3246 of Deuteronomy, he says, take your, 
Take to your heart all the words that which I am warning you today, this is after we sing the song, which you shall command your sons to observe carefully even all the words of this law. So it, the Song of Moses was a futuristic telling of what was going to be happening when they get into the land of Canaan, but it was a warning to help them re remind them to keep God's words in their hearts. Absolutely. I think that, that the word warning there is a key thing. It's really a, a caution uh, that you need to be careful uh, with this reminder of things uh, that have happened. And so um, it, it's trying to prevent further disobedience. Uh, but on the flip side of that, it's also to instruct. And it is trying to, to urge uh, obedience. And so there's uh, a lot of good reasons why we would, we would want to study the history and why God put it in uh, the form of these songs so that, yes, it is something that is going to constantly uh, be remembered uh, by them. The passage in Romans 15, what does it say? Of course, I'm learning. That was true for them then, and that's very true for us today so it's written for uh, our learning and it's something that that should continue to be important to us and we should continue to share it with our children um, so I think that one of the things that uh, he did a, a good job with as far as the the lesson is he kind of went through uh, several of the themes uh, in regards to history that we see throughout the Psalms and they're dealt with uh, individually with each of the questions so that's what we're going to to kind of go through uh, the lesson. And so the first one talks about creation. And so what I'd like to do is read some passages in Psalms that talk about uh, creation, and then we'll answer question number one. So go ahead and turn over to Psalm 8. So we'll start over here with Gil, work our way back, and then uh, jump back over to Robert Spear and work our way forward and then go over. We've got several passages um, with all of these different uh, accounts of history that I want to, to look at. So the first one, Psalm 8. Uh, let's just take three verses apiece as we go around. And so we'll read all of Psalm 8. Gil. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. You who set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and infants you have ordained strength because of your enemies, that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained. What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? That you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings, and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. All sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes through the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. All right, here Psalm 24. Uh, the, the lesson actually referenced Psalm 19.1, which I think uh, we're all familiar with. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. And then whoever is next in line, go ahead and read so, uh, Psalm 24, 1 and 2. The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell there. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. And then the last one, Psalm 33, uh, whoever's next, read 6 through 9. Psalm 33, 6 through 9. By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea together as they heat. He lays up the deep in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of Him. And it stood fast. All right, so these are just a, a snippet of some of the Psalms that actually deal with creation or at least reference creation. And so question number one says, how does the history of creation in Genesis teach us about God? Brother Bill, what do you think? How can we learn about God from the creation account? Well, we we uh, understand a little bit more about how things were formed uh, through the Word, but creation itself testifies to us, as, as you referenced uh, Psalm 19.1, uh, 
and it was something that was important to me in my life as I was growing up because I first believed in God through that evidence and then I found the church. So uh, it's unrefutable evidence that there's the existence of God and things we see around us. Yeah, I think that that's, that's one of the, uh, the, the beauties of creation. You can uh, maybe not have a knowledge of the church, but you can recognize there, there is a higher being, there is a God just from creation. Ken, what do you think we can learn about God from creation? Uh, his power, uh, the fact that uh, he blesses man with every, every good thing that man has, uh, the creation around us uh, provides for all of our needs. Right. There was, a, I guess in that first paragraph, he made mention there of how one commentator said, history is the soil in which literature grows. And so when I think of soil, I think of uh, roots, I think of a foundation. And so I had read another commentary that says, if we possessed a Bible without Genesis, we would have a house of cards without foundation or mortar. We cannot ensure the continuing fruit of our spiritual heritage if we do not give place to its roots. And so... Yes, like uh, Brother Bill and, and Brother Ken said, uh, I think that from the very beginning we see an all-powerful God without beginning and without end. Uh, and that is something that is uh, very important for us to, to recognize from the very beginning. And what, should the, what, what reaction should this cause us to have? What's that? To be filled with awe. So we should be filled with awe and we should then uh, recognize the, 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 the praise that is due our Creator. Um, and the book, I think he points that out, how that it should be a, a cause for praise, for wonder, uh, for glory, as we recognize creation. Norm? One of the things that God uh, gave us as part of uh, being like Him is this insatiable curiosity. And, uh, and people in, in, in the world of science, to, you know, science is to know is what that is what that means, and and they they boo hoo the idea of God, but it, in fact, early scientists, you know, it was in the in the desire to know and get closer to God and know and know God that drove all of that early uh, seeking of knowledge to try to to get closer to Him to understand His creation and all that was all all baked into that pie, and God gave us that innate uh, desire to, to be near Him and know Him. Yeah. One of the things that we uh, read there in, in Psalm 8 and uh, verse 5, it says, Yet you have made Him a little lower than God, and you crown Him with glory and majesty. And I think, I think that, that this uh, helps us to understand how creation uh, really displays God's love for us. And... Uh, I think the psalmist here is just re rejoicing in that. And that is something that, that we should see from the, the very beginning, God's, um, God's love. And so it, obviously it makes sense why there would be psalms that are going to uh, discuss creation and cause these reactions uh, in those that are singing these songs of, of praise, of awe, uh, giving glory to God. So uh, something that, again... Is, was good for them and will continue to, to be good for all of us that continue to, to uh, sing the psalms and study through the psalms. All right, so moving on to the Exodus. Turn over to Psalm 78. And we'll do three verses apiece again. Psalm 78, uh, picking up in verse 45, I'm sorry, 43. So we'll read 43 through 53. When he performed his signs in Egypt and his marvels in the field of Zoan, he turned the rivers to blood and their streams they could not drink. He sent among them swarms of flies which devoured them and frogs which destroyed them. He gave also their crops to the grasshopper, and the product of their labor to the locust. He destroyed their vines and hailstone, with hailstones, and their sycamore trees with frost. He gave over their cattle also to the hailstones, and their herds to bolts of lightning. He cast from them the fierceness of his anger, wrath, and the 
and troubled by sending angels of destruction among them. He made a path for his anger. He did not spare their soul from death, but he gave their life over to the plague and destroyed all their firstborn in Egypt and, their, and in the first of their strength in the tents of the ham. Where did you get to? Fifty-one is what I read too. So fifty-two. Is it fifty? Right, fifty-two. Uh, but he led forth his own people like sheep and guided them in the wilderness <laughs> like a flock. He led them safely so that they did not fear and the sea engulfed their enemies. <clears throat> so he brought them to his holy land, to his hill country, uh, which his right hand had gained. All right, I'll turn over to Psalm 105. And Robert will pick up in verse 27. We'll read 27 through 38. Again, everybody take three verses apiece. Psalm 105, 27 through 38. They performed his signs among them and miracles in the land of Ham. He sent darkness and made the land dark. They did not rebel against his words. He turned their waters into blood and caused their fish to die. Their land swarmed with frogs, even in the chambers of their kings. He spoke, and there came swarms of flies and gnats throughout their country. He gave them hail for rain and fiery lightning bolts through their land. What, through what verse? Through 1 through 38. He struck their vines also in their fig trees and splintered the trees of their territory. He spoke, and the locust came, and the young locusts without number, and <clears throat> ate all of the vegetation in their land and devoured the fruit of their ground. He struck down all the firstborn in their land, the first fruits of all their strength. And he brought out of Israel with silver and gold, and there was none among his tribes who stumbled. Egypt was glad when they departed, for dread of them had fallen upon it. All right, so question number two, very similar to question number one, says what does the history of the exodus from Egypt teach us about God? Gil, what do you think? What, what can we learn about God from the exodus from Egypt? God's a just God, and He punishes those who don't obey Him. Okay, He's a just God. He's going to punish those that don't obey Him. Todd, what do you think? What can we learn from uh, learn about God from the Exodus? Uh, the phrase that He bore them out on eagles' wings comes to mind, and His ability to deliver <coughs> so much power. All right, being able to deliver. Norm, did you have your hand up? Uh, scratch. Oh. <laughs> Anytime I see this motion. Uh, somebody else, what, what, what do you, what do you uh, think we can learn about God from the Exodus? He keeps his promises. His promises. I think that's a huge one. Uh, because if you're the, the people of Israel and God had made all of these promises uh, so many years ago to Abraham and you've heard this all your life and well here we are in servitude, like we're not even our own uh, nation. I mean we're just slaves to a, a group of people and so you know in the minds of the people well, God obviously is not a faithful God because he didn't keep his promises. Uh, but we, uh, this is a, a, a very good story that I think helps us to, to recognize the fact that God is going to keep uh, his promises. Um, and I think that all of the book of Exodus emphasizes God's intentions to, to fulfill those promises from the, the beginning. It, it's that he is going to, to fulfill those promises. What else? Right. <coughs> is in control of all things. He is in control of all things, and that's something that obviously should, should create uh, a certain amount of fear amongst the people, uh, 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 respectful fear for the fact that he is in control. Robert? Piggybacking right off what Brandon said, I was going to say he's, it shows that he's omnipowerful. He has control over all things, and if I'm sure a lot of us have done studies of the, the plagues and all that kind of thing and how God literally struck down their gods with the different things he did. Their rivers were a god. There were so many different, because they're polytheistic. He, for lack of a term, he insulted their religion by showing there's no one like my power. There, there is no power but my power. And that, it's a strong statement shown throughout Psalm. We're talking about people forgetting when we're talking about, you know, why we're here. Multiple times throughout Israel's history, we see, and there came a generation that did not know him. 
He's, this is being written down to show that it does not matter when in time it is, God is omnipowerful. Yeah. So it's kind of like with the creation, and for those that were a part of this, that were going through, crossing through the river, what reaction should they have had in regards specifically to God? Power. Right, and so what, what should that cause then? <laughs> Definitely. Norm? Um, first, first commandment, fear God. <laughs> uh, as in awesome respect for the, the uh, creator of the universe. Should Francis. Have... Oh. Okay, but let's imagine we are going through that. And what would you physically, emotionally go through? There's no words for that. It's just something that it's unbelievable, but it is happening, and God is in control. Yeah, I mean, if, of course, without being in the situation, but I, I feel like if I was in that situation and I'm, I'm, I'm walking across on dry ground and I'm probably scared because uh, the, the army is behind me and uh, I've got the walls of water here, that you know, obviously God is providing us for, but now I've got this army behind me, and so I'm probably still scared. And you get to the other side, and the the army is drowned in the sea. I mean, I feel like my knees would be weak, and I would immediately drop to my knees and and begin worshiping God. That uh, thank you for what you have just done for me. Um, I think that that would be a natural reaction, and I would hope that because of everything that now has taken place to get us to this point, even while you were in Egypt that it is going to increase your trust in the Lord. Daniel? Yeah, that's where I was going, is that it should have cultivated belief and faith in, in the people. We see many times, you know, just as we see in our own lives sometimes, we, we see what God has done, but at the same time we forget that in the moment, and, and we, we don't have that belief that faith that we should have based on what God has, has done for us. I like the word cultivate because there should have already been this, this faith and this trust, but then when you go through these experiences, it should just cultivate it. It should make it stronger, should build it up uh, as you continue to go through these situations and God continues to come through. Jeff? I was just thinking that actually the belief in faith converted to knowledge. There was more faith and what was happening? They were they were walking through the sea. Yeah, that, that's knowledge. That's not faith anymore. It's there. It's right in front of them. Yeah, you can't doubt that. Um, let's go ahead and jump down to uh, question number three. And so, turn over to Psalm 106. And this is talking about the events at Sinai. Yes. So turn over to Psalm 106. We'll read a, a cut. Just a, Actually, we'll just read this one passage before we look at question number three. Psalm 106, 19 through 23. Marissa, now you read. So uh, if any of the borchers want to read, Psalm 106, 19 through 23. They made a calf in Horeb and worshipped a metal image. They exchanged the glory of God for the image of an ox that eats grass. They forgot God their Savior, who had done great things in Egypt, wondrous works in the land of Ham, and awesome deeds by the Red Sea. Therefore he said he would destroy them, had not Moses, his chosen one, stood in the breach before him to turn away his wrath from destroying them. All right, question number three says, Mount Sinai is a place in the southern Sinai Peninsula in present-day Egypt, but when you think of this place, what are some of the thoughts that first rush to mind? So this uh, psalm here in Psalm 106 obviously is referring to a couple of events that had taken place there at Sinai, but, uh, and I'll just open this up. What, what are some things that first come to your mind whenever you think of Sinai? Norm? Emptiness. You said Empty. em emptiness? Emptiness. <clears throat> you want to elaborate? <laughs> uh, when you look at it, it, it looks like a moonscape. It's, it's, uh, there's just, it, it's, it appears to be completely lifeless. It kind of re reminded me of Jesus when walking in for the 40 days in the... So you're thinking geographically. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking okay. geographically. Uh, just my mind was not geographically thinking. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
but and it's probably because like, I get to fly over it for hours of the you know this territory. So you have a totally different perspective than me, because that is not the first thing that comes to my mind. The Jeff was talking about experience. So uh, yeah, what's uh, what, what first comes to your mind when you think of Sinai? No. Ten Commandments, <clears throat> because that's where people of Israel got them. And in general, Moses talking to God, or God speaking to Moses on the mountain. So God being with Israel, I guess, over there. Yeah, yeah, that's, that, those come to mind really quick for me. Robert? goes back to what I just said about how they, they forget so quickly. They <clears throat> were not that far removed from walking through the Red Sea. We talked about dry ground. We all know what it's like when it rains and it's dry and our socks get wet through our shoes. I firmly believe that when it says that they walked on dry ground, that if the, that if the Israelites wore socks, not one got wet. Mm -hmm. And we get to this point where they say, well, we don't know what to do. And now all of a sudden they're sharing their gold to make a golden calf because they need this thing to worship. And just this mm -hmm. absolute loss of faith in a relatively short amount of time is, it, it's kind of jaw dropping. Yeah, uh, a few times when I've, I've preached sermons about you know these these stories that we read about in the uh, the Old Testament, we we have the 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 hindsight of actually looking at all of the events and how they transpired, and we we easily make judgment on them because it's easy to do and think, man, I would never do that. Uh, but then yet, oftentimes in our own lives, spiritually speaking, we do the same thing uh, where we. Uh, lose our trust in God and we begin trusting on men and other things. So, who had their hand up? Erica? So what Lena was saying and Robert, what I answered my question kind of put both of them together. You think of the Ten Commandments, you think of this golden calf, but what just happened, like it, it is so astonishing to me when I think about it is I think that mountain, that landscape just shook. I mean, literally shook an earthquake, a storm, you have fire, you have lightning, you have this huge storm going on that the Israelites are scared out of their mind. And then they, they like, they didn't just go through the Red Sea and travel some more. Like, they just witnessed yet this, another miracle. God just shook this place. And then they turn around and make this golden calf. It's like, what? I yeah. mean, how can you? I, I mean, I, I seriously cannot wrap my brain around it. Yeah, I mean, they seem like such a fickle people where, uh, again, their faith should be cultivated, but well, I mean, Moses, our leader, he's gone. He got swallowed up by the mountain, I guess, so we got to come up with somebody else that's going to lead us. I mean, this golden calf makes as much sense as anything else, right? All right, let's go ahead and move uh, to question four Psalm 95. We'll read uh, 9 through 11. I've got a passage in Psalm 106. You know, there's a couple of these psalms, Psalm 105, 106, 107. It's almost like a, I would call it a Cliff's Notes version of the history of, of Israel. Uh, it's in, I, I mean, just think of singing that in a song. And you're able to, to go through all of your history and how uh, impressionable that should be uh, upon you. But uh, we'll just read Psalm 95, 9 through 11, whoever's next. When your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they have seen my work, forty years I loathed that generation and said, They are a people who go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. Therefore I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. All right, so if you want to just mark it down, uh, Psalm 106, 24 through 33, <clears throat> kind of gives a little more uh, information there as far as the account of the wandering of the wilderness. But question four says, list six things that occurred during the wilderness wandering of Israel. Having done this, now list anything spiritual that you may uh, see to you to be a parallel. And so uh, just, just list me one. Bonnie will let you go first. So just list me one, um, something that may have occurred and maybe a, the spiritual parallel. Um, there's the fiery serpents and how Christ was lifted up and drew everybody to himself. Alright. Miss Shirley, what, you got one there that... Well, I had that he provided their necessities. They wanted mm -hmm. uh, bread and water and meat. Yeah, I mean, even during this time of, 
of punishment, you can say he still continued to provide for them. So what, what does that say to us? Manna, and he gave them water, and then he gave them the quail. And he was also a God of mercy and judgment. Yeah. So he continued to, to care for them. He will continue to care for us as well. Jesse, you got one? Twelve flowers, cloud by day, fire by night. Mm -hmm. The Lord guides us through life and watches over us. All right. Daniel, you got one? Yeah, providing water from the rock. Jesus is our rock and gives us living water. All right. So I, I thought of... Uh, Another one of the, the giving of the water, the situation with, with Moses and Aaron, uh, and obviously that did not allow them to enter into uh, the land of Canaan. And it just made me think about the fact that Moses was such a great leader uh, in, in almost all respects, and they had gotten to this point, and yet he made a, a pretty serious mistake and sinned against the Lord. And so we have to be careful because being a leader does not make us immune from, from sin. Uh, and, and doing wrong even when we're in leadership positions. Um, one other one that I thought of was the core Dathan and Abiram and how important it is to uh, listen to the authority of the Lord and not go against the authority of the Lord. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of good things that we could uh, talk about there in the wandering of the wilderness. Let's go on to the conquest. Uh, turn over to Psalm 44. Psalm 44, and let's read verses 2 and 3. You with your own hand drove out the nations, but them you planted. You afflicted the peoples, but them you set free. For not by their own sword did they win the land, nor did their own arm give them victory, but your right hand and your arm and the light of your countenance, for you delighted in them. All right, so what do you think are some key lessons that we can learn uh, about God from the Bible's historical record of the conquest of Canaan? Norm, what do you think? What can we learn about God from this historical record? God keeps his promises. Yeah. Somebody else. Marissa? He's more powerful than all others. All right. Miss Shirley? Like Norm said, I had God was the conqueror of the land, not the Israel. Yes. <clears throat> Definitely. And that's a that's a key one to remember. Jennifer? Um, God can overcome any odds no matter how impossible it seems. Definitely. So God would continue to, to be with them. And obviously we know that they didn't do everything that they uh, were supposed to do. And so then we see them taken into uh, exile. So uh, quickly, I want us to go ahead and look at question number uh, six. And so I had Psalm 106, 34 through 48, so we won't take, t take time to, to read uh, through those because we're running out of time. But in regards to the exile in Babylon, um, what does that teach us about God, about sin, and God's plan for man's redemption? So uh, any of those three, I'll just open it up. Miss Shirley? He's a forgiving God, and, but he will punish the unfaithful. All right. So the unfaithful will be punished, but he is also a forgiving God. Somebody else? Promises. <laughs> yeah, there's a recurring theme there. There is a, a recurring theme of that, uh, and there's a, also a recurring theme of what does God want us to, what kind of, um, I don't want to say emotion, but um, God wants us to trust him. And, and I think that that is one of the things that he's trying to teach the people along the way is to, to trust in me. You can trust in me. I, I have proven myself time and time again. You can trust in me. Erica? It makes me think that when we're humble and obedient, that's when God provides restoration. Yeah, we can see that through the, the judges, that uh, cyclical thing there. 
I think that one of the, the psalms that I, I think of whenever I think of God wanting us to, to trust in him is Psalm 25. Uh, in the very first part of it, uh, beginning of verse 2, it says, Oh my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be ashamed. Do not let my enemies exult over me. Indeed, none of these who wait for you will be ashamed. Those who deal treacherously without cause will be ashamed. Make me know your ways, O oh Lord. Teach me your paths. God wants us to, to trust in him. He wants us to trust in him today. And oftentimes, we don't. Uh, again, we'll, we'll trust in ourselves. We'll trust in uh, other men. We'll trust, trust in money. Uh, we've got so many things that uh, pull us away from actually trusting uh, in God. Miss Shirley talked about there about how sin is not going to go unpunished. Uh, it was mentioned there about God's plan will always uh, be fulfilled. Um, and so... In regards to God's plan for man's redemption, do you see anything there? Verse 5 says that you are the God of my salvation. You are the God of my salvation? So what about for, for us? What can we see in the, the, the exile and the return? Francis? He did promise, and his son did come, and he is our salvation, and it's all through God's will and his son's obedience to his will that we are where we're at today. Norm? Um, God, God loves us. We wandered away. He wants us back. And and, and his, whole, his whole plan of, of salvation and creation and everything revolves around that love and us wandering away and him being true to his promises and wanting us back and doing everything that, on his end that he can do to make that possible and it's just up, up to us. Todd? <clears throat> yeah, he, he lets us wander, right? He lets us go and gives them over to, to their um, sins and so even in that dry and weary land when we long for for God, He is there to save and to bring us back. Sam, we also see the dual purpose in, in God's punishment, that His providence can allow bad things to occur and for these uh, people to be disciplined, but also for it to be turned into something beautiful and that the seed can be sown over the land and people of God can turn entire nations to God. Yes. Now get your songbooks and turn over to number 23. So one of the things, the, the themes, I guess, that I, I think that we see throughout these historical accounts are uh, that, that God's promises, uh, they will be fulfilled, um, that he, he is faithful, that we should trust in him, and that it should cause us to, to give him worship and honor and praise. And I think all of those things are what we see throughout all of the psalms. This isn't one of the songs that was listed in the book, but as I was studying through, I'll be honest with you, uh, I did not remember this being attributed or directly from Psalm 25. So I read a few of the verses there from Psalm 25. Um, but unto thee, O Lord, we'll sing this as we... This is one of the things that, uh, again, it's, it's uh, helping me appreciate the Psalms more growing up. I mean, so many of these songs we have sung over and over and over again, and I have uh, no knowledge that it comes directly from the Psalms. And this was God's intent, that these be sung, uh, that, that we admonish one another, that we learn from these through singing them. So thank you, everyone.